Hey fellow creatives, welcome back to my channel. Today we're gonna to be painting a bird and there are two key things to keep in mind when you're painting a bird. Firstly, lots of birds have this beautiful bulbous chest. So we're gonna look at ways to create a round shaped animal. The other thing that's specific to a bird are feathers. So we're gonna look at how to create lovely soft feathers, particularly on my kookaburra, they were on the top. If we're gonna include soft lines, then we need to include some hard lines because the hard lines are gonna make the soft lines look even softer. So if you're gonna go and get your own photo reference, a couple of things to keep in mind. I've gone for a beak that is on the three quarter angle, partly because I wanted to practice that. Sometimes I like to challenge myself. Uh, you don't have to do that. The beak can be on any angle, could be front on like I am to you now, could be completely side on like this and like this. This is actually an easier angle, so it will depend on how much um, you want to challenge yourself. Do you want to make it a little easier for yourself? Then get a bird with a side facing beak. If you want to challenge yourself, go the front on or go the three quarter. So much that I've got to share with you in this video. I wonder whether or not you might consider taking your device, especially if you're on a uh, your phone or you're on a mobile device like a a tablet, a laptop, pick it up, take it over to where you paint and consider putting the laptop near where you paint and just dabble along with me. You might just do a little bit, you might do some of the exercises, you might look at the colours that I'm going to recommend. I want to share everything uh, with you. The colours include how to mix beautiful greens and browns and warmth and coolness that I've balanced off in the painting as well. So much to share with you. I hope you'll hang about and please give me a thumbs up if you get anything out of the video. This kookaburra provided so much opportunity for joyful wet in wet method, which is my absolute favorite. And you'll find that I've done a lot of the wet and wet with my larger brushes. And then as you move into the detail, your brushes will get smaller and smaller. And that's really quite common in painting. Big brushes at the beginning, smaller brushes at the end. The Kookaburra reference photo, I took the image myself and this wonderful Kookaburra landed on my pool fence and allowed me to video him for about five minutes. So that meant that I had an incredible wealth of images to choose from. And I chose this one with the three quarter angle to give myself a challenge, as I've mentioned. So I often go out into the backyard in the morning and I often will hear at least two kookaburras singing away. I'll play a recording of their incredible songs a bit later in the video and I absolutely love it. It's a beautiful reminder of this incredible Australian bird. It's quite a big bird and it's a carnivorous bird, so it flies around aiming to eat lots and lots of lizards. Well, that's what it tends to eat in our garden because that's what we've got lots of um, those little tiny, tiny skinks. So I took a little while with the drawing, but not too long. I wanted to get things really correctly um, drawn like the beak and the head and I took a little while checking that the bird looked as similar as, it could, as I could to my image but mostly I wanted to just do an outline and you can see I've not done any shading, I'll do all of that with my paint. I'm using a piece of Baohong watercolour paper. It's a quarter sheet and I didn't bother to tape it down. You can see that it's a little bit bent when um, I zoom out again in a second, you can see that it's sitting up a little bit. Um, that's a little bit annoying because the paper arrived like that, but um, it didn't matter that much. Because I wasn't going to be soaking the background, I put in a very light wash on the background. I didn't bother to tape it down. I didn't need a border on this particular one. I used that big round Quiller palette. It's a big ceramic palette. And I am able to do all my color preparation on, on that one palette. I don't have to get out a separate page to see whether or not I've got the colors right. I can do everything on that big ceramic surface. I absolutely love it. 
The colours that I am getting out are Daniel Smith's Lunar Earth. I absolutely love that. So I got out two browns and Daniel Smith's Lunar Earth. And I love that one because it granulates. And Holbein's Burnt Sienna, which has a lovely granulating effect as well. Um, I've also got a video, by the way, on how to make your own Burnt Sienna. If you don't have happen to have Burnt Sienna, you can make a version of it. The green is Daniel Smith Cobalt Teal Blue Turquoise. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, most of turquoises are completely beautiful. I've used lots of them. The pink that I took out was a May Marie Blue Opera Rose and it's really, really intense. And there are no real pinks in the kookaburra, so you'll see that I dulled it down a little bit by adding a little bit of burnt sienna. And so I get this reddy brown color that is going to work beautifully with my browns. Lots of lovely opportunity in this painting for leaving some white of the paper. And so by, you'll see by the end of it that I did in fact leave some little tiny bits of white but mostly they get covered with incredibly pale washes so that the paint so that the beautiful paper can shine through i really take my time with the preparation of my colors i want to check that i've got the right green there's such a beautiful green in the kookaburra's feathers It's not until the end of the painting process that I start to think about how to balance the warm and cool. There just nearly always is on my palette a balance of warm and cool, but it's not until I've nearly finished applying all the paint that I can make that decision about whether or not I've gotten the colors right, whether I've got the balance right. So that's something that I look at much nearer the end of the painting. Mostly I squeeze out fresh colour, but it, you can see me also activating a little bit of colour as well. So I use the palette colours uh, a little bit like pans, but if I'm painting a large amount of a particular colour, I always squeeze out fresh colour. I love fresh colour because it makes you lovely and fast. The brush that I've got sitting there on the palette uh, that's resting at the moment is my absolute favorite black gold 311 it's a quill with a beautiful snap and a beautiful point this is its smaller cousin it's a round brush and I begin with that particular round brush because it has an incredible point to it so it's not an incredibly small round brush but that point allows me to keep painting so you'll see that I don't really need to reload much when I'm painting with this round brush, it allows me to keep painting. It just keeps delivering paint. I mixed up my own gray, which was ultramarine and burnt sienna. It makes that magic gray, a little bit like a black, but not dead like a black. So it's got this beautiful depth to it. I've left little tiny highlights on the eyes. If you miss out the highlight, you can add a little bit of gouache but there's nothing quite so beautiful as leaving a little bit of white paper. I really find that that's rather marvelous. And of course, if you use gouache, you really are painting in mixed media. And my goal is to not do mixed media. Not that it matters whether I do or I don't. I'm happy to just do whatever is gonna make the painting work. But I have that always as a goal in the back of my mind. Try and use the white of the paper for any whites. I'm really taking my time with some lovely little details there. The eyes took a matter of minutes to get right and I'm just staring at the image, as staring at my reference photo that is, and going back and forth. And that's why you can see me hesitating with my brush over and over. I'm staring at the image, where does the color go? Stare at the image, where does the color go? So I spend a lot of my time staring at the image. It's really important.
I'm switching there to a larger brush. That's my mead and mop brush and it's just loaded with water. And all I'm gonna do is soften out all of that lovely color that I've applied and you get that magic mix of hard edges and as you soften it off, you go soft edges. So you get a tonal range as well as getting a lovely mix of hard and soft lines. Kookaburras are, from the, are related to kingfishers and they're native to Australia and New Guinea and they grow, I got this from Wikipedia, thank you Wikipedia, uh, they grow between 28 and 47 centimetres. I've been in the National Park, I live in the south of Sydney so I often go to the Royal National Park, I've been in the National Park where kookaburras have lined themselves up around our picnics and you really have to protect your food because they will dive in and uh, steal and particularly any meat you might have on your sandwich because they are quite carnivorous. The kookaburras are quite well adapted to suburban life. And when I see them, I've got to be honest, they're not in a gum tree. <laughs> uh, there's that wonderful song, Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree. I won't sing it to you because you'll cringe and I really want you to relax instead and uh, paint along with me or enjoy watching the kookaburra come to life. But this, the kookaburras that I see are actually sitting on top of the electricity pole. They really quite like sitting up there and they'll sit in pairs, not necessarily next to each other, but nearby and they will sing together and one begins and they sing in a type of chorus. It's really, really, really lovely. I think this might be a great moment to play the kookaburra sound to you. I'm using pure turquoise to add into the back of the kookaburra. It really was a bit of a stretch to say that there was pure turquoise in the back of the kookaburra, so totally artistic license at this point. I absolutely love turquoise, so any opportunity I can have <laughs> to use turquoise, I do. I'm calling it turquoise, but the real colour name was cobalt teal blue. One of the advantages in using your own reference photo is that you don't have to attribute anyone, but that's nothing. I know some lovely artists who work from other artists, uh, as in photographers work, and then they just attribute them. It's quite a nice partnership that they've got going on together. But I love painting from my own photographs, particularly because there'll be a memory attached. And I just love the idea that I'm painting something and at the same time, the I'm remembering that kookaburra that landed in my backyard and I love the idea that that extra level of enjoyment that bring is brought to painting um, your own photographs. I thoroughly find it way more satisfying than painting other people's photographs. I rarely paint other people's photo photographs um, unless of course it's a commission and even then, if it's a commission, then I really love to hear some stories from them. I like to hear about how they felt and what it was like on the day they took those photos. And uh, 
really try and get a bit of a vibe going for what it was like. soft background here. That Meaden mop brush is so fast at applying water. It's just big and beautifully capable of holding and delivering water really fast. So I'm about to paint the feathers on the head and rather than paint the actual bird, I painted negatively. So I'm going to put in a series of brown marks. Uh, there are bits of brown on the kookaburra's head and I'm constantly touching the dry of the head and the wet of the wet background. And this way I have created soft fluffy edges, some hard edges on the head, touching the head and then lovely softness. And I've gone back to my mead and mop brush to carry the softness away from the bird. So it's outlining the white parts of the bird with a little bit of soft colour as well as creating some softness and some fluffiness to the bird's head. Lots of artistic licence in I didn't paint any of my back fence. It wasn't necessary in, in painting this kookaburra. It wasn't at all necessary to include some of my back fence. So I just paint in a lovely soft background. As I'm working, I'm working the whole time between the detail and which is often a harder line and a smaller brush and then I'm jumping away to the bigger brush so walk, working from a small brush big brush small back small brush big brush it's not always how I work I vary the way that I use my brushes all the time just to suit the subject that maiden allows that lovely big mark to go in and out and because it's got that beautiful point to it, I'm able to use the point as well as the belly. And every time I do a big fat mark, I'm using the belly. And every time I do a thin mark, I'm using the point. So these Meaden mop brushes came in a set of four. I bought them on Amazon and they're not too bad at all. A um, couple of them shed a little bit, so I haven't been recommending them. But for the price, they're not too bad. Anyway, I thought I would go and buy a few more and then couldn't find them. So don't know what happened to those mead and mop brushes. This black gold small quill, that's a zero zero that I'm using now, has just been the most brilliant brush. I've got, I don't know, about 10 of them because I paint in multiple spots. So I have brushes in my studio and then I have a kit for when I go teaching. So I keep that, um, it's like a duplicate of a lot of the stuff that I have in my studio. And then I also will often buy extras to uh, sell to students because I regularly meet students who want a recommendation and I regularly meet students who don't like online shopping. So I go and buy extras and then just sell it to them. Actually, I used to do a lot of that, but as time's gone on and, and I've gotten a lot busier, um, I don't always uh, do that. Though, you know, anyway, it all varies. Okay, I'm moving down to the um, breast. And every time you see me pause, it's because I'm staring at my reference image and I stare at it as much as possible. Same method there of apply the paint and then make it soft. But you can see that I'm using the smaller brush, that's the smaller quill. And the way that I've made the marks onto the breast is to give it that fat roundness. 
So in a moment, when I move my hand, there you go, you can see that every one of those strokes that come, came down onto the breast were done in a semicircular manner. And in that way, even though a lot of the marks match up, you know, they kind of mix together, there are little extra lines that are encouraging the suggestion that it's got a big bulbous breast. And it does, lots of birds do have bulbous breasts. And the key to that is to use strokes as you would as if you were doing a detailed drawing. You stroke the brush in the direction of the shape of the bulbous chest, which means really that you're doing strokes in the shape of semicircles that move from the center of the breast out or the outer side of the breast in. I'm using that lovely same method again. Apply the paint, grab my big brush and soften off. Because I'm pretty happy with the way those first lot of cross-section paint marks worked, I go back in with a, a, a I go back in with a darker tone. All of those lines that I put on the base of the belly of the bird were mostly vertical, and even though they mix up together. I continued adding vertical mark, vertical mark, vertical mark until they all join up. It would be much faster to just have done a horizontal stroke on the bottom of the bird, but I find that sometimes if you use your brush in the way that you would if you were drawing, then you get these really lovely marks that you that create texture and a little bit of tone and definitely create create lovely bits of interest. I'm negatively, negative, I'm negatively painting the branch. In the actual photograph, the kookaburra landed on my pool fence. So I didn't want to include a pool fence because it's actually a glass pool fence and I thought it might look odd. And also I don't want to paint a glass pool fence. So I tried to make the painting more naturalistic by inventing a stick. And I begin by negatively painting the stick. Uh, you can see again at this point, my strokes are vertical. So even though the marks 
uh, the marks on the feathers were horizontal. I'm using vertical strokes to make up those horizontal strokes. I hope that makes sense. You get this lovely textural look and I, kn I know that most of those strokes end up joining together but I'm amazed at how often if you use your brush like you would be using a pencil then you get these lovely textural effects worth taking your time with that. And every time I'm hesitating with my mark it's because I'm checking my ref reference photo. I was checking, checking, checking the whole time. At a certain point you need to get rid of the reference photo but not just yet because I'm still in that detailed phase. You need to get rid of the reference photo when you are nearly done. You need to like move the reference photo away completely and make colour decisions based on warm and cool and whether or not you like it and make tonal decisions based on tone, the dark parts and the light parts and is it convincing, has it done what you want and the other thing that I do towards the end of a painting is make decisions based on warm versus cool because I love when I get that balance right and when I say balance I don't mean 50-50, quite the opposite. I love when I get the balance right <laughs> and really the word shouldn't be balance but that's uh, what all the reference books love to refer to it as, getting the balance right in your painting. What I'm referring to is actually off balance. So you want the cools to dominate or the warms to dominate. Well I do, I think that looks beautiful when you allow either the warms to dominate or you allow the cools to dominate because the cools make the warms look good and the warms make the cools look good. So if you have an imbalance of warm versus cool, it can look so interesting. And that is my utmost, that is the goal above all other goals is to make an interesting painting. I want a painting where the viewer comes along and looks at it and really wants to spend a few minutes enjoying my painting. If you can get the viewer to remain looking at your painting, it's a really good sign for sales. It's a really good sign for competitions as well because you want that judge to stare at your painting a little longer than someone else's painting. If the judge is just walking straight past your painting, then you're unlikely to get a place in the competition. Judges always, and I've been a judge of competitions before, and always it's the paintings that you are drawn back to time and time again that has that certain something that is making it more interesting than the other paintings. I'm not into realism, I'm into impressionism. So impressionism is about the light and making it light and airy and just suggesting that something has a beautiful presence. And I really feel that was my goal with this kookaburra to just give a certain presence to the kookaburra. There are a couple of things that I've exaggerated on the breast that you can't really see on and I couldn't really see in the reference image. Because I wanted to give the breast that round bulbous shape, I've increased, you can see that little line in between the breast, I've increased that line in tonal quality and length. It doesn't come up that far up the breast but that really helped give the breast a bit of a bulbous look. The other thing that's giving it a bulbous look is the fact that there are darks below it that get darker and darker as they move down and there are some mid-tones above it. I'm coming in here with some turquoise. I'm calling it turquoise but as I mentioned earlier it's actually cobalt teal blue. I'm coming in and just going around and adding little bits quite from my imagination. I just love cobalt teal blue which I'm calling, I really think it's turquoise. 
I love it, so I you am using way more of it than is in the reference photo. I find it deeply satisfying to use. And so now I'm negatively painting the other side of the stick. And I'm also negatively painting the base of the kookaburra's tail. And that has made some of those lovely white feathers stand out. So I didn't need to paint any white anywhere on this bird. Any white that you see is the white of the paper. So I achieved that goal. Yay, big tick. White. <laughs> white paper is white, not paint. I don't think it matters how you get there as long as you satisfy yourself. Big lot of extra water there that I'm soaking up with another mop brush that I absolutely love. This is my Kazan Neef mop brush. Uh, the reason why I bought the Meaden ones is that I needed another Kazan Neef mop brush and I went to buy one and found that they were an extraordinary price and it's a superb brush, absolutely superb. If you can afford that one, get the Kazan Neef mop. It is the best mop I own. But I just couldn't, just couldn't uh, pay that um, incredible price and I couldn't find it on special. And that's how I ended up on Amazon. And with the Meaden set, I thought, oh, well, for 30, 40 bucks, and there's three in the packet, I think I'll risk it. And it's been pretty damn good. The head of the bird is all dried now. So I'm coming in with my kneadable eraser and with just getting rid of those final little pencil marks. My goal with most of my watercolors is not to see any drawing marks. I really um, don't like seeing pencil unless it's quite purposeful. And for me, those pencil marks were purely as guidelines. You could see I did all line work. They weren't anything to do with tone. And that's why I took a second then to remove the final guidelines, any pencil mark, before I come in and do the final wash because watercolour traps a pencil mark, so once you've painted any paint over your pencil, you can't rub it out. I'm adding more turquoise, and it's quite a muted turquoise. It's turquoise mixed with a bit of burnt sienna. It's kind. I'm running my finger over the angle that the beak has. I really took my time with this. I'm turning it upside down to stop my head from painting what is expected of my imagination. I want to observe it in terms of what is really there. I'm keeping my eye on the head for paint, negatively painting around the beak. And you can see that I'm actually pointing to it because I wanted to really take note of exactly where I was going. I know it seems a little crazy that I keep my finger on it, but I found that as I was, um, as I'm using, as I'm, my eye is moving from the palette to the paintbrush, to the paper, to the image, that I was losing focus. So I just put my finger there to say, okay, focus completely in on getting the beak right and getting that um, eye right. I also realized that there was a little section behind the eye 
there that was all feathers and that also helped to make the bird's head look a little more convincing and when I say convincing I mean <laughs> it looked, made it look correct really tiny bits of paint there to go around the eye I'm getting really close to the end and just coming in with some lovely muted greens and when I say muted I mean turquoise mixed with burnt sienna and at this stage it's probably got a bit of everything in it too that mop brush is so marvelous because you can use the tip and that particular one didn't shed but another one that I bought did shed so again that's why I don't recommend it so I've turned it round to get a final look and you can see me pointing with my brush going right does this look right does that look right I literally am using the brush like a pointer to examine where I might need to improve things where I might need to soften things and I decide that that lovely white section on the kookaburra's breast really needed softening off. I've included so much in this video about softness and getting soft lines and hard lines. And I think they're really key to making a painting interesting. That is a little cheap flat up flat brush and I'm scrubbing here. So I felt that that all needed to be softened off. So I'm scrubbing and getting rid of the hard lines. I felt also that there was it was a little touch too dark. So I'm going scrub, scrub, scrub to just soften all of that off. And so you can see that the side of the breast goes off to nothing. You can't tell where the breast starts and finishes. And then I continue up there with that flat brush, just going soften, soften, soften. I often do that at the end of a painting actually. Use There's two things I do at the end of the painting, a little bit of detail, so often with a small brush go around doing detail, but I often do a bit of scrubbing as well and usually use a flat brush for that purpose. I'm going to add a little bit of realism to the stick. And now that I'm looking at it, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but now that I'm looking at it, I can see that, I don't know that the stick needed that. It's quite a nice white, but there's nothing I can do about it now. I add a little bit of realism to the stick by adding a little bit of tone, just a tiny little bit. Maybe it was a good idea, maybe it stops your eye from uh, looking away, maybe, maybe it's good. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it actually. Did it need a little bit of tone on the stick or do you think I overdid it at that point? I'd love to know. So in this exercise, we've covered so many things. We've covered soft lines and hard lines, the techniques to get soft lines and hard lines, the importance of having a reference photo that has meaning for you, or the importance of having a reference photo at least that suits your purpose really well. So a reference photo for me was a photo that I took, and it also was a three-quarter beak. And in, at the very beginning of this video, I talked about how the three-quarter beak provides some struggles for um, getting it right. And the easiest type of beak is to turn the beak on the side, to get the side on view. So we talked about the reference photo and uh, we talked about soft lines, hard lines. We talked about the colors. I've talked a lot about that um, palette and mixing the colors. If you don't have a large palette like this, I recommend getting out a piece of paper to check that your colors are as beautiful as you would like, that you love the color combinations. Final touches here on the breast. 
So doing strokes that are suggesting I'm a round shape, I'm a round shape, I'm a round shape. If you were painting a pair, I'd be using, if I was painting a pair, I'd be using those same sort of strokes, round strokes that say I'm a round object and that's, I'm just continuing that with a brush that with no paint on it uh, and that just extends the lines around, softens the edges of them and I'm just deciding does the left hand side of the breast also require some lines to indicate that I'm that I've painted a round body. I'm sitting and staring at the reference photo. Have I got it all right? I need to balance off that lightness that I want to capture in any of my watercolors. I don't like to overdo it too much. I never make mud because I'm using single colors or transparent colors. And if I'm not using transparent colors, like cobalt teal blue is not transparent, I'm using it in a very limited way. And I never mix a color that is not transparent with um, another color <laughs> that's not transparent. Um, most of my colors are transparent anyway. Tiny little bit of touches to the beak. You can see that I added a tiny bit of that beautiful turquoise or teal blue, just in case you love that color. You could see that I scrubbed it a little bit first with my flat brush because it's got a beautiful highlight on it, that beak. And I wanted to see if I could capture that beautiful highlight. Taking my time to get it right at the end. I was really quite relaxed by this point. To help you relax, it's worth playing music or um, sometimes I just play podcasts. Really taking my time. I'm lifting out now. So this point of the painting process, I'm using that flat brush and I am doing little tiny lifting strokes. I'm going dirty water, clean water, drying it off so there is a tiniest bit of moisture and then you can see I lift the paint. Lift, lift, lift and dirty water, clean water, dry it off and then go back and work out where else do I want to lift the paint. I'm going around and turning any hard lines into soft lines that I think will help. Sometimes I find some lines distracting, so I'll just soften them. That helps, I think. Lots of little tiny fiddly marks at this point. Really important not to overdo it. Really important to put your brush down. If you feel like you're not improving the painting, stop, take a breath, put your brush down, stand up, have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee, and come back to it with some fresh eyes. The other thing that I love to do at this point is take a photograph. And while I'm painting and videoing, I'm also able to see the screen that has this view on it. Usually I have uh, two cameras going, but this top-down view is shown to me on my laptop. So I'm able to look up at what the view is that you're going to get when you watch this video and look down again at the image. So I'm constantly uh, able to check uh, as though I've taken a photograph. The other thing Thing that you can do at this stage of the painting is squint. S squint just like a sunny sunny day and remove some of the tone and think to yourself oh is it working? Is it looking convincing? Have I got it looking like a round shape? I've turned it on its side so that I can look at the eye. And that's when I discover there's a little bit of body behind the eye. That's the value of having a really good reference photo. In, <laughs> because the dark 
fence was behind the dark kookaburra, I realised that uh, there's a little bit of the head that's behind the eye. So I soften that all off and I come in and add a little bit to show up the little bit of the eye. Hopefully you've been painting along with me or maybe you've been practicing some of the elements that we looked at in this video, the soft lines, hard lines, a little bit of color mixing perhaps, or perhaps you just did a bit of drawing. It doesn't really matter what you did. Perhaps you just sat and enjoyed a long cup of tea and watched me bring the kookaburra to life. Either way, we've covered such a lot and I really wanted this video to be about including every step. There are so many times I've watched videos and I've wondered, well, what happened in between that cut and the next cut? And so I wanted to make this video about absolutely every step. And I've done that so that I'm now finishing off the bird and these are the actual final touches that I've made, such as making the beak pop out a little more. So I've added such incredibly delicate, small bits of detail because it's so easy to kill the beak. <laughs> kill the bird, kill the eyes. It's very easy uh, to ruin it. And that, uh, having said that, I'm using quite a light tone so I could just lift it off if I needed to. So this little bit um, is really fiddly and I add some and I take some off and I add some and I take some off and I am constantly staring at my reference photo in order to try and get that beak looking like that lovely foreshortened three-quarter look. I really hope that I've covered everything and if you have any questions, if there is anything that further you'd like to know about, if there's anything further you'd like to see turned into a video, I would love to hear from you. I love any feedback at all. I've finished the painting here by signing it in my favourite turquoise and a really fine pointed round brush. And I always consider where I'm going to add my signature because you can add the signature absolutely anywhere you like. Signing it on the bottom right is a very traditional art spot for signing. And I chose very specifically to kind of make my signature a part of the painting and not separate it. And I felt if I put the signature on the left, that was kind of gonna separate it out a little bit. I'm coming back in here with a final little delicate touches and I wanted to include them as well because there's little tiny things that I do right at the end that I think make a little bit of a difference to the look of the kookaburra. I'm going to pop on some lovely little mu bit of music to finish off the video with and I hope that you'll um, give me a thumbs up and give me a bit of feedback. I would really love it for my first ever long form completely uh, include absolutely everything video. Oh no that's not true there's some live videos on my YouTube page that have every step included. So if you've enjoyed this video that has every step included why not check out my live videos because they have absolutely every step included and lots of explanations and um, there's questions that students ask along the way and you might find that helpful. Thank you so much guys. See you next time. Bye.